Well, welcome. Um, we are about to talk about uh, sparkling wine in cocktails, but I, th I think in a little more depth than, than maybe what you're imagining. Now, the image behind me, you'll have to forgive me, it's from Pompeii and I'm kind of in love with it, but this is somebody mixing things together and the things they mix together were wine and, and maybe beer and probably not spirit, but the sort of flavoring ingredients that we associate with uh, with some of the spirits that we talk about today. So I just thought it was, you know, would kind of set the scene. Now I'm joined today by Miss Frankie Marshall. And uh, I, I think uh, none of, uh, you know, Dale or Frankie need an introduction per se, but I, I, I think that they're here because they have vast experience in, in uh, cocktails, in designing cocktails and creating cocktails, but I think most importantly, in helping to explain to a, a staff or a customer or whomever exactly what's happening when we, when we add sparkling wine to, to a cocktail. So if you'll allow me to just turn the, the floor over to, to Miss Frankie to say hello, how are you? Hello, everyone. Hello, Doug and Dale. First of all, thank you so much for having me on this panel. I'm really excited to be here. Yeah, this should be fun. I'm, I'm, I'm digging it. So, uh, Dale, how you doing, man? I'm good. I'm good. Uh, glad to be here. Uh, can't wait to talk about this stuff. I think sparkling wines are taking over the world. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, the Brits part. <laughs> we need celebrations right now. So, you know, yeah. the bubbles help. And, and before we even really get started kind of talking about individual um, sparkling wines, individual cocktails, and things like that, and some of the, the strategies. Um, can can we just start by saying, champagne cocktail? I mean, are are we just going to be talking about the champagne cocktail, Dale? Is that you know, Frankie? Uh, Frankie, is it just is it just the champagne cocktail, Frankie? Would you? No Hell way. no. <laughs> <laughs> Hell no. No, it will definitely not just be the the champagne cocktail. And I'm actually really glad we're discussing this because this is a topic that's been neglected for so long, and I find it interesting that so many people, so many of us obsess over ingredients and provenance and which uh, which brand we're going to put into a cocktail and then the recipe at the end will just say yeah and top with sparkling yes right you know, right and that's it yeah. so there's so many more things out there I, and some of the products that we probably talk about today are not going to be easy for these people to find anywhere so not in the local liquor store or anywhere we got the internet that's what it's for and we also for the professional bartenders out there we have wonderful importers and distributors in the long tail market, friends of ours like Eric Seed, who's willing to bend over backwards to find stuff you want and bring it into your market. So there is ways to get the things we're gonna be discussing today. I think even though they're not down the street or in your local distributor, uh, that, that's a good thing. I mean, this Prosecco thing, for example, Amanda Hesser wrote about it back in 2001. If you'd mentioned it back then, every wine snob in the world would have just, you know, look the other way. But that's not true anymore. And I thought at first the Italians had been doing it for a long time, but apparently not. I did an extra reading and Vito Cassuni, who's the uh, Aperol uh, marketer for 20 years now, says it was really still wine in the spritz and soda prior to 1988 and that the Aperol push bringing the Prosecco into the mix was a relatively new thing. I didn't know that. So it's, it's a lot to talk about. Yeah, indeed. And, and to, not to try to put the champagne cocktail to bed, but I, I, I still want to know, I mean, Frankie, do you think there is a, a you know, a, a, or do you have specific ideas about what makes an appropriate champagne cocktail recipe? I'm, I'm, is, is there a simple way for us to think about this? Well, I think it's an interesting um, question because that's a cocktail that doesn't get ordered that often anymore, at least in my experience. But I think that part of the appeal of the champagne cocktail is actually seeing those bubbles kind of rise up from the sugar cube in the glass as it you know goes to a table or as it sits in front of a guest. So um, if I were making that, I'd hope to be using real champagne, right, Dale? <laughs> as opposed to any other sparkling in this case. Uh, but of course, you know, we have to use what we have, but if I'm going to make it with champagne, I'd like, I would choose a zero brute, which we're going to talk a little bit more about later, but something without any sugar added to it, because you're already, you're going to be adding a, a sugar cube to it. So I, I find that if you, you know, you use a brute or something sweeter, it's just going to be too sweet. So I would definitely go for the zero brute or extra brute, a drier style with this cocktail. 
And yeah, you know, you use the sugar cube for visuals. You know, I'd go one extra dash of bitters, maybe three dashes, and then you've got to pour. This is one of those drinks that's always overflowing, right? Every time you would make this, it's there it goes. Uh, you have to, you have to simply pour. Oh, maybe not simply, but pour slowly, right? And that actually is part of the show, right? That's you know, for the guests, there's that anticipation as you know the 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 uh, you're pouring in and the mousse is rising, rising, rising slowly. So um, that's you know, that's what I would do and just make a big show out of it. If you're doing it again in front of the guests and pour slowly and use that zero brute. So it's not an overly sweet cocktail. Yeah, we will talk about zero brute. And, and, and I think that's a really important distinction and, and one that some people may be challenged by. You don't see as many of those around. So um, we'll, we'll return to, to that idea. But yeah, I, I totally agree with you with regards to the show. I mean, as, as a sommelier, uh, you know, pouring sparkling wine, there's nothing more fun than having people look at the glass like, oh, we poured too much. And then, you know, just <laughs> that, that moment, the meniscus, and then it just kind of settles down. And you're like, you think I never did this before? Are you kidding? You know? <laughs> so, you know. Right? <laughs> All true. So I mean, there's a secret to it. If you can find a flute that turns in slightly at the top, those bubbles will go back down the center and when you pour slowly. And that solved the problem for me. You know, they're not they're hard to find. They're they're a shape like this, you know. And they yeah. curve down the top. But it does help. There's no question. And yeah. and uh and, and and so um Dale, I mean obviously we're gonna be talking about a lot of different cocktails. Um uh, maybe the French 75 too. You know it, it, Frankie said that the the <laughs> Really, the French 75 in the new world that we're living in now since the new millennium, since the craft cocktail movement, has really taken over for the, for the champagne cocktail in a, in a large way. Everybody, know, everybody feels more comfortable using uh, balancing cocktails, acid versus sugar versus strong. So people don't need that to worry about that anymore. So making the champagne cocktail. And I, I, I'm, I'm gonna say, yeah, you gotta, if it says it in the name, you got to do it. You got to use the champagne. Although I am not gonna be the guy to come down on a first time bar owner, pinching his pennies and worrying about his cost of sales. I'm not gonna do that. But I will say there are ways of marketing your products in a clever way so that you can and if you have the demographic in your in your audience, and you may and not even know it, they will pay for quality, and they will pay for for things that are innovative and cool. And the French seventy five was a place I was able to do that both at the Hotel Bel Air and at the Rainbow Room because I pretty pretty well healed crowd. I mean, you know, I had people come in and say, "Look, I want to want to get a bottle of." Crystal, and we want to make French 75s out of it. And I'm like, yeah, I'm all over that. <laughs> you know, this is kind of like the Vegas thing, you know, a bottle of service, but a little classier. You know, you're not, you're not hitting them hard just to hit them hard. And you're going to give them a, you're going to charge them a little surcharge to do that, but you're going to kill them. You know, they're already paying on, you know, 250 bucks for the champagne or 150 or whatever. So, and, and, and we got to start thinking also about the two kinds of French 75. If you go to New Orleans, you're not going to get gin. You know, you're going to get cognac. Period. And, That's and right. They, yeah, they were the they they were the torch holders of the French 75. If you went to any bar in America, believe me, in the 70s, and ordered a French 75, except New Orleans, they were looked at like were crazy. <laughs> a real high end hotel, you know. Yeah. So they really were the torch bearers, but it was a gin drink. So now, do you really want to use the same champagne in the cognac one that you're using the gin one? Maybe not. Maybe you want that toasty biscuit style that you'll get with, you know, that kind of on the lees for a long time kind of champagne for your cognac because it's going to play into those flavors that are coming from the cognac. And for the gin, light, fresh, you know, fruity, you kind of want to go in that direction maybe with your choice, Perrier Jouet or something along those lines. Paul Roger, another light style, wonderful, you know. Some of the some of the bigger yeasty ones uh, yeah, a little more expensive, you know, but there are some that you can find that have that 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 yeasty note too that are not crazy expensive, you know. Well, and it's a, it's a funny it's a funny thing. Back in the 19th century and maybe before, I don't really know about that, but we know we have some record in the 19th century that people actually would add 
we wish it were cognac. It was probably just brandy to to champagne when they were uh, producing it. It, it. it makes things richer. It makes things you know more expansive. It made most importantly, it made the wine seem older and more noble than it probably was. I'm so. sorry to say that in the bars that I worked in the '70s, it was Corbel or it was Christian oh, yeah. Brothers. It wasn't a lot of brandy went into those brandy drinks, not cognac, because everybody was watching their pennies. You know, yeah. it, was, yeah. it was a different time. Yeah. yeah, I believe I believe that's called esprit de cognac. Actually, what you're talking about the addition of the cognac to to champagne. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, it's not a. I mean, it's it's not a, a bad uh, combination unless you're just looking for very fresh flavors because obviously it's going to take uh, whatever you're mixing together a different direction. It's going to make it much. You know, it's going to add that almost caramel note and and all that. So you know, it's a stylistic thing, but it's it's not unheard of. Let's just put it that way. You know. So, well, um, if, if it's okay, I was just gonna run through, you know, the, the briefest of explanations of, of what these categories are and, and what these possibilities are, because we're talking about more than the champagne cocktail, more than the French 75, and certainly we're talking ultimately about more than champagne. Um, sparkling wine is made anywhere wine is made. Uh, literally, uh, all you have to do is capture the bubbles and you've made a sparkling wine. Yes, in, in the, the lowest end examples, you could actually add bubbles as we, as we tend to do with beers, but in the main, we're talking about high quality sparkling wines from all over the place. And, and so I just wanted to, to give people, you know, sort of a flavor of, of what the possibilities are. We are talking about a, a, a fermented product in which the bubbles have been captured, the bubbles of fermentation, whether from the original fermentation, you know, the primary fermentation where alcohol is created, that's unusual, but that's that's mentioned or at least referenced down at the bottom of this slide with method ancestral or method tradition, uh, method ancestral tradition, as it's called. But in the main, we're talking about what's called method traditionnel. Sorry if it's confusing. I didn't make these terms up. This, these are, you know, the official terms. What we once uh, always called method champenoise or the champagne method. Now, if you make wine by the method champenoise in France and you make it in the place called champagne, fine, you call it champagne. But if you make it by that method any place else, you're no longer allowed to say method champenoise because it's not from champagne. So it's not champenoise. Instead, uh, you'll be called Cremant de, let's say, wherever you come from, whether Cremant of Bur Burgundy or Clement de Bourgogne, Clement de D, the place called D, Clement de Bordeaux, Clement d'Alsace, you get it. And then the other common methods we're gonna be referencing are the cube clothes or the Charmaw, which is basically how Prosecco is made. And uh, the transfer method, which is utilized in, in uh, some areas and, and specifically is, is important when it comes to um, how champagne can show up in half bottles or the little tiny guys. Uh, carbonation, as I mentioned, is something that is is really just fit for the the lowest end, which usually say somewhere on the label "serve well chilled." Because if you kept going around, the label says "serve well chilled" because this crap is so awful. If it's not really really cold, you'll taste how it actually is. Okay, um, champagne place. You can see it on the map. Uh, it is a, a f as far north an area of wine production is, as you'll see, that's to say it's a very cold uh, area. That's to say the grapes don't get very ripe. That's finally to say it's acidic, it's tart. And that's part of its virtue. That's part of its, the, uh, I, the idea behind it is that it can, because of its high acidity, it can last a long time. And people don't think of champagne this way, but truthfully, champagne is typically kind of old by the time it gets to you. It's a wine that has been asked to last a long time because you made a wine, then you put that wine in a bottle, you put some yeast and, and a little bit of sugar in there so it could create another fermentation. Then you let that sit there for a year, two years, three years, four years, sometimes 10 years. And then you disgorged it to get the dead yeasts out of there. And then you sold it to somebody and then it got shipped to wherever it was going. And then it got shipped to a wholesaler, then to a, a bar, then to a restaurant, then to you know wherever where you poured it for me. And I took a smell and I said, I think this is much too young, but we'll keep it, we're fine. Right. OK, that's the place. It is comprised of a few different areas. We, we sometimes um, uh, consider some of those areas a primary for Cote de Blanc, let's say for Blanc, the White Hills is for Chardonnay. OK, the primary white grape of the area, whereas the other areas, the primary areas will mix the three major grapes together. Those three major grapes, Pinot Noir, Chardonnay, Pinot Meunier, as you can see on this uh, slide, you know, we we 
give some approximation for why each is there, but each is different in, it, in its own way. What is critical and, and what all, uh, uh, or I should say almost all of the vineyards of Champagne have in common are varying amounts of chalk, which is a, a kind of soil that tends to create even higher acidity, therefore longer lived wine. And then aging Champagne, as we say, will then uh, uh, give us the categories. Most, most Champagnes are non-vintage and the category of non-vintage Champagne means that it's from several vintages. It's multi-vintage multi as, as some Champagne producers call it. How many? Could be five, could be seven. It, it depends on trying the, the, that blender, trying to make the champagne taste as a non-vintage, exactly the same every single time. That's not true of vintage champagne. Vintage champagne, which comes from a single harvest, is generally more expensive, but also variable. It, it absolutely is variable. You get to a vintage like 2002, which is this great classic vintage, and it's well poised. And then you get to a vintage like 2003, which is warm, and the wines are kind of bigger and fatter and richer, um, but not necessarily as long lived. All right. And then we'll talk about things like Cuvée de Prestige, or just the top lines, Dale reference Cristal, which you usually don't pour in your champagne cocktail because it's a Cuvée de Prestige and it costs a lot of money. Okay. And, and then there are these minimum agings. And, and, and this is, as I was saying, having the, the dead yeast cells the lees, as we call them, sit in that bottle creates the, the what Dale was referencing, that toasty, biscuity, even sometimes chocolatey character. And the longer it sits there, the more extreme that flavor can get. So non-vintage wines require 15 months, whereas vintage champagnes require at least three years. And as I said before, can be much longer. And then, as you can see in the picture on the right, you got to get that stuff out of there. Um, if you go to Champagne, you'll see people do it by hand. Nobody does it by hand anymore. It's machine done. It's a big old machine that goes rrr, 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 and, and shakes an entire pallet of like 56 cases of, of bottles all at the same time. And in a week's time can get all the sediment down to the neck of the bottle. We freeze the neck solid, turn it upright, knock the crown cap off, you know, pressure blows the plug out. Bob's your uncle as, or whatever they say, um, you know, you're done. But then typically people will add a little bit of wine because you lost some wine when you blew the plug out of there, right? You've got rid of the yeast cells. And when they add wine, they'll add a little bit of sweetness to it. Now, Frankie said earlier, brut nature or extra brut or however you want to say it, but that's a bone dry or virtually dry wine. And, and so it's, it's a, a, if you will, not the classic. The, the classic is brut. Brut is what most people associate with, with champagne and what the vast majority of champagnes are, are uh, sold as. So it's got some residual sugar to it. You don't notice the residual sugar because of the bubbles. The bubbles dry your mouth out. So as we go up in these le levels of sugar, you aren't going to see very many demisecs or dews or things like that, but they're out there and they may be useful to you at, at, at some point. Um, there are other categories, of course, rosé, where we blend things together, um, and, and those wines are a little fuller bodied, usually not as long uh, lived, but they're fuller bodied, Blanc de Blanc, only made with Chardonnay, which is the longest lived of all champagnes. I've had you know, 30 and 40 year old versions of that that are still fantastic. Blanc de Noir, made only from red grapes, and, and then sometimes single vineyard uh, wines as well. The uh, transfer method, which I, I, I mentioned before, uh, basically eliminates what we call the riddling or that whole process of trying to turn the bottles or turn them with a machine or whatever to get all the, the leaves down to the neck of the bottle and then pop it out. So here you just pump the stuff into tanks, filter the leaves out, and, and again, Bob's your uncle, you're, you're good to go. Um, the, the, the comment is always made, well, that's a lower quality than the classic method. And, and, and it does interfere with the delicacy of champagne. But I always want to point out that, yeah, but any half bottle or 187 you have of champagne was made exactly that way. Any larger format, like a three liter of champagne was made that way. So is it really that it doesn't make better wine? Yeah, whatever. Uh, the Charmant process or cube close just means closed container. That's gonna happen for a lot of aromatic varieties like Moscato, whether it's Asti Spumani or Moscato d'Asti or Riesling and Prosecco, okay? Prosecco is usually made in this, this fashion. And then there are other sparkling wines made in, in uh, France that uh, we could talk about. I just wanted to mention them because they're other grapes. And so they're gonna have other character and, and sparkling Vouvray or uh, sparkling Samour, I think sometimes is just delicious and really interesting. And it is not necessarily sweet. Um, you, you have to find out whether it is kind of sweet 
or sometimes even bone dry, um, but it has a honeyed character to it that can be really, really interesting as a float. Um, the same could be said of, of these others that are relatively, uh, I think, obscure, but you can find them and they may be on your wine list. And you know, if, if you're associated with a, a restaurant uh, that has a wine list, and, and again, they can be fun as, as a float or as something uh, as an addition to, to something else you have going on. But Prosecco is king right now. There's no question about it. Once upon a time, we called the great Prosecco, but then people started, like in Australia in particular, started making Prosecco, quote unquote, labeling it as such. And the Italians were like, ah, you know, hair on fire, what are we doing? So they renamed the, the grape, and it, I know it's a traditional name, but they, they had a little hanky banky going on there. They renamed the grape Lera, as it's, it's described, and, and then renamed, or at least codified the name of the area as Prosecco, so that they could say, no, you can't call it Prosecco because Prosecco is a place. If you do see Prosecco de uh, Canigliano Valdobbiadene, that is primo stuff. And, and Prosecco can vary from dry to sweet and from who cares to this is freaking delicious. And, and so I think it's important to understand that's a choice you make if you play with Prosecco, if you work with Prosecco, and, and if you have Prosecco. I love Moscato. I think that the, the Moscato Dosti wine is uh, a wine that some people might assume uh, that, that uh, wine snobs turn their noses up at. Please don't do so. I used to have this Burgundy group that they only you know, bought and drank really expensive Burgundy. And I'd always pull out a bottle of Moscato Dosti to finish the thing and they drain that thing. I mean, it was just like, you know, out of the bottle if I'd let them. Um, High-end Italian wine like Francia Corta, it, it, if you will, aspires to be as great as champagne, and I think in some ways is or can be. Um, it certainly is priced <laughs> similarly, which I, I think is a, a problem sometimes. But if you're an Italian place, or it's an Italian cocktail, or or an, a, you know, th there's there's a way you want to bring to people's attention that uh, this is an Italian wine. Therefore, making I, I, I think. Uh, Forgive me, because I, I could tell, you know, Miss Frankie and, and Dale are kind of like, hmm, but you know, you want to do it with French Accord? That's okay, isn't it? Okay, maybe not. And Lambrusco, I'm just got to throw the ad out there for Lambrusco. It can be dry, it can be sweet. It is a delicious wine. I had one with, with charcuterie the other night in an Italian restaurant, and it made me so flipping happy. So don't turn your nose up at that. Don't turn your nose up at Zect. Uh, just make sure you know which Zec do you have, because there's Zec that's made from things like Miller Turgau and Silvaner that's okay. There's uh, Zec that's made from Riesling and even some that's made not in the tank fermentation method, not in cube clothes, but by method traditional. And Cava, which was once as ubiquitous as Prosecco, probably still is in many places, is made by the method champenoise, okay, or the method traditionnel. I'm not supposed to use the word champenoise. I'm so sorry, okay. Um, but it again varies from grocery store, who cares, to as expensive as champagne, and frankly, delicious. Um, the the problem therein is a lot of people have never had the really delicious stuff, so they're like cava tastes like cava, and I'm like, if you'd spend more than ten dollars on a bottle, you'd see. Um, but some of the top end brands, as as, as noted on this. Uh, slide have gotten so fed up with the fact that Cava is associated as a grocery store wine that they they no longer even call themselves Cava. They call themselves things like Conca del Rui uh, Anoya or Classic Benedese or Corpinat. So it's it's a place that's struggling, if you will, right now. But the wines are always good prices and I think good values. And everybody makes wine. Even India, you know, makes sparkling wine that's pretty damn good and pretty surprising. And I always have to say, and it's not all about the same sparkling wine grapes. Traditionally in the United States, the single first uh, successful wine program, really, if you will, wine production area was the Cincinnati Wine Company, which made a sparkling wine from Catawba. And we're talking about millions of cases a year. Not It wasn't small scale stuff. And this is the 1830s. Um, it, it's funny to me, I still, when I pull up the, the word, the, the, the um, you know, well-known at this point, thank, thank you, David Wondrich, Chatham Artillery Punch, it will still say almost uh, knee jerk on whatever website or whatever, it's like, well, sparkling Catawba is really hard to find. It's only hard to find if you're a freaking snob, okay? It's really freaking easy to find this stuff because they grow up from New York to, to the Midwest and it's not expensive. And I will always make up a, a play for some of these hybrid grapes because they have a lot of times really striking acidity to them so that they, they can create some balance. 
Yes, if you're having a Catawba, it's going to be sweet. So deal with that, but I'm sure you did. Um, and and those, those wines can have really dramatic aromas, more so than the classic grapes vinifera. I'm sorry, Chardonnay does not have a dramatic aroma. It never will. Uh, it, that's, for some people, one of its, its assets. So look for things like Valvin Muscat, Traminet, Vito Blanc, and finally, don't turn your nose up at local wines. Help out the local folks, okay? And local wines are better and better. And okay, you know, so it just comes back to, no, it's not just the champagne cocktail that we're talking about today. And, and there are all kinds of, of sparkling uh, wine and cocktail combinations we, sh we should and could be talking about. So I'll leave it at that. And, and uh, I guess I would just say, uh, Dale, you know, there are so many uh, different, styles and, and uh, characteristics of, of sparkling wine, that it does seem uh, uh, absurd to me that a lot of our professionals are like, let me get my sparkling wine. Here's the one, you know, we're good. Is that, I mean, <laughs> Dale, is that unfair of me? No, not at all. I mean, I, I and, that, and you know, going back to the Franciacorta, we have right here in America, you know, some really special wines that are they're not wildly expensive out in California and, and other places. And you know the Catawba, we had a sweet tooth. In the yeah, 19th century. serious sweet tooth. The, the world had a sweet tooth in the nineteenth century. I mean, sugar, God, it was everywhere. Um, but you know, even in the French seventy-five, my next version of it was the Japanese seventy-five, and this was playing just for this seminar. I'm I'm bringing to the party uh, uh, Ichiko uh, Saiten, which is a 43% alcohol soshu made in Japan, made just for the bartending community, by the way. Uh, and I'm bringing it to the party uh, yuzu on top of a normal lemon. And in this case, I'm using Meyer lemon because I like the aroma. And I think it goes nice with the other aromas that are happening in it. You can either do it as a shrub using two Meyer lemons and two regular lemons. Meyers don't have enough oil in the skin, sadly, to make a proper shrub. And then you bring that all the juice should become the Meyer because that juice is a little bit better than the other juices and the other lemons, in my opinion, for this, for this drink. Uh, and you know, you do the whole sugar thing, I a little, little less, three quarters of it, instead of a whole cup for the four pieces of fruit, you know, David Wondrich is a wonderful punch program. Now you don't have to do that, but it, what it does is it gives you 16 drinks, boom, right off the bat, because you get 24 ounces from what I just talked about, you know, and you, you don't add the water. And now if you want to just do the Japanese uh, uh, 75, well, then you go three quarter uh, lemon, use the Meyer and three quarter simple. And you mix it with the some kind of a, a different kind of other than London dry. I would go Hendrix. I would go maybe one of those honey based gins like Bartrand's or, 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 or a Bar Hill maybe. And then you uh, bring a couple of dashes of yuzu to the, to the party. And then you top it with a sparkling Riesling from, from where? From uh, upstate New York, you know, why wouldn't you? Because it does have a lot of aroma and flavor that plays right into the things that are happening in this drink, you know? All right, so we got a Japanese 75. I'm not gonna call it a French 75, I'm gonna call it a Japanese 75. And I, and I'm, 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 I'm gonna do that more. <laughs> you know, you know I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna let everybody know too right uh, now that if if we're referencing recipes in here, we'll make sure that that you have access to a list of recipes. And I, I should tell people as well that that whole list of wines that I tossed in front of you, and you were supposed to be taking careful notes throughout, but you probably weren't. Uh, you were having a drink instead, as you should. And so there's a document that you can access as well. We'll we'll make it available to you. Soon. And another Mr. Potato at 75, and what I, I I'm borrowing from Julie Reiner now, our Clover Club. Queen, uh, Julie Reiner makes the best Clover Club in the business, but I'm gonna take that drink, which is a natural. I mean, what's it got in it? It's got gin, it's got lemon, it's got some beautiful berry stuff happening. You know, that's that's an open door for me uh, to top it with something really, really special. So um, I, I, I went in the, well, they don't even call it Prosecco, the one I went to in this case, it's at Bisson Glenavino and they have a metal cap so they can't call it Prosecco. You know, it's got a metal top cap top, okay. but it's Prosecco. And it's a good one, you know, and it's Frizzante style rather than really, really crazy explosive bubble style, which also I like. So you got, you got that with its, 
uh, all the things you get from Prosecco, then you got the berries, the raspberry thing happening, but if you want to do that style of the Clover Club, which I love doing, making a very simple syrup, you know. Uh, and uh, this recipe you also can get. And then, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a really nice take. And I, I'm, I'm betting that there are many, many other cocktails. What do you think, uh, I, uh, Frankie? There's many, many other cocktails that are topped with soda that are opportunities here, you know. Uh, definitely. I think just about any cocktail can benefit from sparkling wine for sure. <laughs> No, that's, I mean, I don't think there's ever a wrong time. <laughs> Sorry, what did you say? You said they thought so in the 19th century. Yeah. Right, yeah, <laughs> exactly. So, um, but with that Clover Club, so you went with, I didn't get that, you went with what kind of, which sparkling did you go with? It's called Stone, and it's a Prosecco, but you can't call it a Prosecco because they had a oh, right. on it instead of a, instead of a cork, but it's made in, in, uh, in the area, you know, in Friuli, and it's got all the, you know, it's, it's right. the right grape, it's the Glera Vino, you know. And so uh, they call it Bisson Glera Vino for Santa Bianco. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I mean, I'll, you know, even just with that example, you could have gone, like you said, a different direction and maybe used a rosé wine made from a red grape, right? And pick, to pick up on those red berry flavors from the raspberry and the clover club. All right. So, I mean, you know, it, it's really about making or making the decision that's based on let me rephrase that. It's really about choosing the correct uh, sparkling that's going to go with what's in your glass, you know, so it's really case by case. I don't think there's one perfect uh, sparkling, or maybe there is, maybe there's, a, well, there's that one champagne out there that will do, you know, the, the whole trick, but, um, and that's the fun part of it, you know, but I just wanted to touch on a couple of other considerations as well uh, for people to think about is that, um, like, what role do you want the sparkling to play? Like, do you want it to play a supporting role? Is it there just to give buoyancy? Uh, is it there just because bubbles look great on a menu and, you know, people are always going to order cocktails with bubbles? Um, is it there just, is it there to give vibrancy, that kind of thing? So if, if it's for that purpose, then you might choose something a little lighter, might choose something based on a white grape, maybe something with, you know, the stone fruit characteristics. Or is it there because you want to perhaps sweeten up your cocktail, right? Then we're going in a different direction. We're going to do Moscato, maybe uh, uh, Stitz Fumante, right? Something mm -hmm. like that. Um, mm -hmm. Or then if you really want it to play a major role, if, you're, if you are banking on the, the flavor, the aromas, the, the style of this particular sparkling, then maybe you're going in a different direction. I happen to love Cava. I think Cava is really varied. Um, there's so many different expressions. Um, for instance, I just the cocktail that I made uh, is happened to be a cognac cocktail. Um, I used a, chose a watermelon basil syrup, um, a little a vinegar with like, it was a rose wine vinegar that had a little strawberry to it. And then I went for a particular uh, cava. It was um, uh, Castoroi, I believe it was the rose cava, and it was really right. It's it's organic and it's just really interesting. It's just it has a little bit of an animal quality to it. It just, and I wanted something to contrast the, the melon and the berries. I didn't want to go with it. I wanted to go a little bit against it and kind of make the cocktail more interesting. I wanted to funk it up. And that's what I did, right? So that's why I chose that one. Um, but, you know, just be purposeful about the choice and the usage. And, um, and again, if you can't find, if you're limited to one specific uh, bottling or one specific um, style, if you're limited to one specific bottle, then you need to readjust your recipe around that, the sparkling, you know, as our great friend Gaz Reagan always said, you know, recipes are guidelines, right? Yeah. They're a base to start from. So, you know, and I see this, we see this a lot where it's just like, okay, that's the recipe, two, three, four, three, quarter, top with whatever you have. No, you have to adjust according to that, whatever you have, according to that sparkling. So. Yeah, I think I'm glad what you said as well, um, because I think so often I, I hear people speak of wine uh, or, or any ingredients for that matter. They're, but particularly they'll take the wine and say, well, you know, I'm using this wine because it has the same flavors that I already have, you know, in this cocktail. So I thought that would really work well. And, and I'm like, yeah, you could do that. But why would you layer the same flavors over and over again, as opposed to what you just described, where you said, now I'm going to add in a different thing that's going to make this more complex, that's going to change the, the personality or add personality to it. I'm, I'm always like, that's your opportunity to, yeah. to say, here's, here's a set of flavors. You're familiar with those. Now I'm going to funk it up. 
you know, and, and everything gets more interesting then. I, I just, I love that way of, of, of doing things. I'm, I want to taste that drink is what okay. I'm <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're gonna remember that this is a high, highly acidic, uh, in, in its some expressions, it's highly acidic. And like lemon or lime, it can balance a cocktail. And not only can it balance a cocktail, it can take all those flavors and shoot them across the tongue. I mean, you know, it's, 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 it's a balancing tool in a cocktail. Like there, there's ways to go, like Dick Bradsell's Bramble. You could either go with a sparkling Portuguese wine or something like that, or you could go with a cava that's stone mineral dry to absolutely, because there's lots of, you know, with, with, the, with the creme de mur and the berries and all that, maybe you want to work against that with a little mineral dry, acidic, and then all the bubbles. Or maybe you want to play into it with that, that, that the three, 3B Portuguese uh, sparkler, which I, I, I toyed with using in that drink as well. So you, you're right, there's, there's two ways to think about this whole thing, you know, as a balancing act or a, as an augmenting of the flavors that are already there. I mean, I, I played with rum a lot because of the airmail. The airmail got me started on this and then I thought, well, anyway, that great, holy mackerel. Here we got uh, Constante down in Cuba came with one of, one of the matches made in heaven, grapefruit, and maraschino, you know, marsh, sweet marsh grapefruit, which was a variety growing back there. And these two things together just exploded on people's and the lime and then the, and then that real, in, in the days when Bacardi had a strong cane character, you know, it was still made in Cuba. Uh, and that, that whole floral, everything about it was ambrosial. And I thought, this is a natural. And, and I, what I ended up using with this was that uh, Lemu brute from, uh, with the honey citrus notes going on from down in the south of France. Right, from, uh, yeah, Blanquette de Lemu, which is the original, probably the original sparkling wine, just so people know, like 13th century. So, you know, been around for a while. Yeah, and it's, boy, they're still doing a good job of it because it's, it's, it's and, and guess what? We're talking between 15 and 40 bucks Right. Around an area for some of it, you know, it's not going to kill you. You know, that's that's the great thing about what we're talking about here as an ingredient that you're going to use one, two, three ounces of, you know, or maybe more with a champagne cocktail. Uh, you know, it's cost of sales can be, you know, good, <laughs> you know, and, and the return on the investment can be even better, you know, because you can tack a little bit more on the price because it is special, you know. Yeah, and just, yeah, and just a couple of other things I was going to say about considerations, as Dale alluded to earlier, is um, the 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 level of effervescence you'd like in your cocktail as well. You know, as we said, frizzante has a little less, like that's probably the lowest level of, of effervescence. Is that right, Doug? Yeah, I mean, uh, generally speaking, and, and, and you know, in, in terms of being able to buy something, th there are some pet gnats out there that can get even lower, but some of those same pet gnats like explode if you take the, uh, the, you know, the crown cap off. So buyer beware on many pet gnats. But yeah, frizzante is the one you can rely on to be a little, a little softer. Right. And then we have things like spumante as we're kind of going up on the effervescence level. And then from there, just everything else, right? Like our cavas are, and all the other sparklings are lambrusco. Well, the lambrusco is actually fairly low. The ones I've tried have been fairly low effervescence. Anyway, the point I'm trying to make is consider that also. And of course, your glassware, you know, that's so hugely important. I mean, it's, I think it's pretty well known by now that the, the champagne flute, the traditional flute is not the best vessel to enjoy a sparkling wine out of. So, I mean, if that's all you have, that's all you have. But, uh, you know, so consider that as well. Consider how those aromas are emanating from the glass as well. Maybe you're going to use the wine glass. Maybe you're going to use something that's a little shorter or, I mean, whatever the purpose is, just take that into consideration also. Let me, let me ask this question. Do you feel like, or do you find yourselves using certain sparkling wines or certain styles of sparkling wine with certain spirits? You know whether just broadly brown spirits and and you know white spirits or or is it, it or or you know do you find a correlation is is that kind of false I, I I'll admit that um, my you know my limited perspective because it is you know just because I've spent less time behind a a bar than than you guys have by a major measure it is that you know when I was dealing with uh, well, let's say whiskey when. I'd play with sparkling Shiraz or Lambruscos or things like that. I just liked the heavier weight they had. 
and and I have done a million times these you know weird things that are inspired by uh, a Manhattan like the Norhattan, which was Norton acting as my sweet vermouth, or things inspired in that direction. So you know I have to admit I I kind of a priori um, look at certain spirits and say, well, I need something bigger on that one. And, you know, certain spirits and I'm like, oh, I need something a little, a little lighter. Um, how do you feel? How do you both feel about that? Well, I, I you know, uh, well, first of all, we know that when it comes to the spritz cocktails, which have taken over the world, the Aperol spritz has taken over the world. I mean, we know where we're going, you know, and, and any bitters that you want to choose, and not necessarily Aperol, if you go to a like a, a, a chinaco or something that has a lot more quinine in it, or if you go to places where you're, you're going to get more bitterness than you get with Aperol, you may want to, you know, look for uh, at least within the category of something uh, a little less, uh, shall I say, light. <laughs> you know, I don't know how much darker you can get up in that area of, of Italy, but I'm sure uh, one of the ones I chose is a, is, is a little bit. Uh, you know, and then there's maybe the possibility of, of, in some cases, you might want to go to Emilia Romano and find some of those sparkling wines down there. Uh, Lambrusco, I mean, you know, that, that could bring a little more weight to a, a, a bitters that's got a little more weight, you know, rather than just the knee jerk Prosecco choice. Um, and then there's like, I wanted to do a, a sparkling Mexican firing squad. And I was searching and I'm thinking, well, where, where am I gonna go? I don't know sparkling wines from Mexico. Uh, honestly, I don't, I know they're there. Uh, I didn't have access to them at short notice. So I went to Southern California. It's got the same ter kind of terroir, weather, dries. And I chose something, uh, I chose the Blanc Noir from Domaine Chandel uh, to, to be the, sparkler on top of that tequila lime and it seemed to work okay I and mean, you know uh grenadine angostura kind of thing that that, that style uh and then champagne always with brandy and, and grand maillet and uh, i'm gonna go to a toasty yeasty champagne in those categories you know but what about if you're going you know to japan or southeast asia you know I know they have a sparkling sake, but what about Western wines match, matched with, you know, uh, Eastern spirits like soju, soju, uh, baiju? Is it possible, you know, that we could find a sparkler that would tuck into those flavors? You know, that would be interesting to see. And I think if we did, it would probably be in the in the Riesling or in the, as you said, something that has big flavor on the nose. Yeah, big aromatics, yeah. Coming from the grape, not from the barrel, you know. <laughs> yeah. Something that's coming from fermentation because they're all about fermentation over there in the Far East, you know. And it would have to be something that tucks into that idea. Highly fermented, but not getting uh, wood aging as, as even part of the equation, you know. Yeah, that makes sense. And, and, and Frankie, I mean, how do you feel about that? Uh, I feel it's really case case by case, dependent on the cocktail. I don't necessarily go by this by the spirits, um, so mm, I'm just gonna keep it at that case by <laughs> case. Okay, well that's fair. Like I said, <laughs> so we we're all making our our French 75s in, in in many cases when we can't grab a bottle of champagne. Hey, we're gonna take what we got. You know what I mean? You're exactly, right. exactly, exactly. And, there's, and I'll take a Schramsberg if I can't get a you know white Chanel. I'm yeah. okay with that. <laughs> And, you know, and not for nothing, that's, you know, where the bartender skill comes in, you know, being able to match what you have with what you're working with, you know, with, with whatever cocktail recipe you're working on, right? So, you know, that, that's up to us and our artistry. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I mean, you know, for those of us who, who have the, uh, had the pleasure of sitting at your bars, it's, it's artistry. I'm sorry. I'm still the guy who could just sit there and just go, Keep making drinks. That's yeah. amazing. <laughs> I am definitely that guy. You know, it's like, hey, there's a creep down at the end of the bar. Just wants us to make drinks. <laughs> so busted. What if you wanted to do a Ricky, but you want to take the soda out? So you got nothing but lime and ginger. You know, where do you go with that? <laughs> do you go Scotch? Really? You go a little on the sweeter side just to make it. You know, I don't know. I mean, do we, 
I like that. I had not thought about that, but I certainly, I, you know, I, I'm still sort of obsessed, like I said, with these aromatic varieties and, and some of these hybrid grapes that people are growing in the middle part of the country. Um, there are two called uh, Tremonet and Balvin Muscat that are very Muscat-like, but then taste very different. They, they can be really like green apple, green pear in the finish in a, an assertive, aggressive way that um, the, the, you know, the mus Muscat grape itself is not. So that might be really fun. I was thinking of that because when I think of uh, shochu, I, I always think of more delicate flavors. So I don't want to, I don't want to beat them up. I don't want to come in there all guns blazing. I need layers, to layers of flavors too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so uh, well, so so let me ask. I, I mean, we've thrown a million ideas at people, and and I guess the question is, it, you know, for the people listening, how do you practically do this? Because uh, we're, we're certainly suggesting that people have more than one bottle open. And I get that, that it, that can be difficult. On the other hand, you get a proper closure on a sparkling wine. It will last a few days. You, it, it's not going to die on you by the end of shift unless you need it as a checkout drink. Then do what you've got to do. But, uh, you know, it, it is that you can have multiple bottles open, especially if you can find multiple applications for them. But, but fr Frankie, I, I mean, how do you how do you operationally do this stuff? And how do you train people to, to, to make well, sense out of this? First of all, operationally, I think you really have to choose the cocktails wisely that you're putting your sparkling into. You know, if you only have two choices, say you've got the you know, more expensive champagne and then the lower priced other sparkling, um, then you know, you're going to put that lower priced other sparkling in the cocktail, but you could also design a cocktail um, that is going to be the big, the one for the big spenders, the one for those, you know, special Saturday nights that, that people might go for. Um, but, but you could also, and another idea is to um, just make that cocktail, make it like one of those, the cocktail that's really going to sell, you know, I mean, there in certain establishments that might be the vodka cocktail in other places that might be mezcal cocktail and, you know, put your, your lower, uh, priced sparkling maybe in that one because you know it's going to sell anyway and you know you're going to go through it a lot mm -hmm. um but a couple of things i want to talk about with um as far as the kind of the day-to-day -day thing is you know temperature is really important you know you have to some people might argue well you're, you're going to shake the cocktail you're going to put ice in it so it doesn't matter what temperature the sparkling's at mm, i would disagree i would say you have to keep it keep it chilled and what we tend to do right we tend to keep it you know in that kind of ice well that's only kind of got a little bit of ice in it you kind of throw it back down there you pick it up you pour it real fast you throw it back down you know obviously that's going to affect our effervescence that's going to you know that kind of agitation is not good for the for the sparkling because it's going to you're going, the bubbles are just going to dissipate so much faster so just take that into consideration maybe pour a little slower and and measure you know, I've heard people say that, uh, oh, you can't measure bubbles because the, the, the fo it foams up and then it goes down and uh, But, you know, just take, maybe take another couple seconds and pour it into your jigger like you would into a glass slowly and, you know, with your jigger tilted, you know, and finish off that way. Um, some people pour their sparkling right into their tin to integrate rather than into the glass. Um, but don't forget to integrate that sparkling because the last thing you want is the first taste for the guests to be just the sparkling wine, right? It has to be right, an integrated cocktail. You stick your spoon in there, just give it one little lift. Don't do this kind of thing. Cause again, you're gonna get rid of all, all of that effervescence that we worked so hard to preserve. <laughs> so, um, you know, and storage, keep it cold, handle it well. And um, you know, what, what to do with that leftover, the, the stuff that goes flat, God forbid it goes flat, um, you know, you can, uh, <laughs> You can, I don't know, make a syrup out of the, the leftover, you know, if you save enough of it, put it in the fridge, make a syrup that you can use as a co another cocktail ingredient, close that loop. You can um, infuse it, you know, make your own kind of vermouth, make all, whatever house ingredient you can. I mean, you can use that, the, what's leftover. I mean, personally, I would just drink it, but that's just me. <laughs> I, you know, don't do, you know, everything that I do, just do as I say. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, as far as, again, tasting, 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 uh, this is what your reps are for, right? To bring you samples of what, whatever you see. So get them to, to bring things in, have the staff taste as well. And tasting groups, I think this is really big with, with wine people, right? They get together, um, these tasting groups, everyone brings a bottle to cut down on costs. 
why not do that with, uh, especially when we're getting to learn about, uh, about different types of sparkling wine, um, you know, and just encourage people, let everybody know that there are differences. I think that's the first step. There are differences. So let's seek out what those differences are. Let's find them and, uh, and then go from there. Yeah, let's let's put those differences to work. So, yeah. so Dale, Dale, where do you get information? Where do you where do you go to to gather, you know, the, well, the information I, that you think you need in order to to help it explain it okay. to a staff member or to a guest or whomever? Very good books out there now. Um, uh, the ladies from Punch have a book called Spritz, Leslie Pariso, and uh, there's a there's a, uh, a lady who's working towards her master of wine, as a matter of fact, named uh, Maria Hunt. Uh, who's got a wonderful book on champagne cocktails and in the back, uh, some really important information, you know, price by price categories so that you can shop smartly and uh, take care of your bottom line. Uh, you know, get a case of these things because if you want to do it, this is the way you do it because it will work, you know, they need to be relatively new because they start to wear out after a while and it'll leak. But um, this will, this will allow you to have those six bottles open. And in Aurora, many, many years ago, when I first went to work with my mentor, Joe Baum, we had a, a copper bucket sitting in a big, huge dish. And it was filled with ice. And, and we were a champagne. You know, this was Gerard Penko. He was from Paris. And he was a two-star Michelin chef. Um, or was it three? I'm going to get in trouble now. <laughs> I'm going to get in trouble. Anyway, I, uh, I, I would keep, you know, I, and I did champagne cocktails. Joe, well, Joe, of course, wanted me to do all kinds of fancy cocktails, which totally mystified me until I found out that he was winning rainbow one. And I, I was doing my Ritz cocktail there first, which I did through every property I ever worked in. But that's where I invented it because I needed uh, something that, that would carry the theme of the restaurant forward and that was the one you know so I would keep the bottles in that in the back of that big copper thing which was always topped up by the barbacks with ice uh, and at the end of the night uh, you know you have to be careful of the labels and handle them very gently and dry them and all that stuff but usually we're moving through the stuff fast enough that was not a problem you know uh, there were certain quick selling wines that were in that cabinet and the other stuff was in the wine cellar in the right part of the wine cellar where it was really cold and coldness i mean the 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 nucleation points in the glasses whether they be scratches or whether they be dirt or or you got to strain your your citrus to the absolute pure no pulp because those are nucleation points that will explode every time the, the champagne hits it every little bit you know in the citrus juice will it'll just go crazy and excite it you know so straining citrus is critically important in your mimosas in your french 75s anything that you're you're mixing really you know in that in that fashion and joe required us to whether you're using the punt or whether you were holding a you know, cradle style, he required us to pour a glass of champagne in one movement, which is why I was so happy to find that flute that curved in at the top because he did not want it to stop until it was at the point of, uh, of uh, eulage at the top of the glass, you know, that was when you could stop pouring. And I had to teach myself how to do this because that's what he required, <laughs> you know. So it's, it's practice handling champagne for sure, and coldness is critical for sure. Although if you got a bottle of extraordinarily rare 1959 Krug, you know. Uh, you do? You I did have it, yeah. you could, and we had it with pizza. You could put it out on the table, you know, get it cold to start out with, but put it out on the table and it'll take care of itself. <laughs> yeah, you, you know, it won't last long anyway. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I remember Steve Olson getting the question from somebody about, his, about uh, Fino Sherry. And the guy said, well, how do you store Fino Sherry? Uh, I mean, uh, and, and when you open the bottle and, and Olson replied, well, it's never been a problem. <laughs> drink it. <laughs> when the bottle was opened, yeah, it needed a closure. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, I, I think, um, you know, most of the, our time is mostly up and, and, and we hope that we delivered at least some of these ideas to you and some of the options, I, I think the options are far more varied than 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 people probably have have considered in the in the past. And I think having this variety 
means you have more you know tools at your at your disposal and and you should grab a hold of that and use them as you can figuring out a way to do it in a fiscally responsible uh, fashion so that the the as 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 Frankie said so you're allied with a cocktail that's moving and and you're not just sitting on you know open bottles which eventually you will have to drink I'm so sorry um, so please give that consideration I, I, I uh, you know, Dale, your your last thoughts on this? Uh, it can be a franchise. If you can think of a way to do it within your cost of sales program and within with the physical layout of your bar, I think it could be the most celebratory and the most interesting and the most uh, newsworthy bar program around, you know, because nobody's doing it. Nobody's yeah. using sparkling wine as the theme, you know, and it's great. And, and Frankie, we should definitely give you the last word. <laughs> uh, uh oh, no pressure. Well, just a practical <laughs> well, thing. I will say that last night looking at wholesale prices, I mean, you can get a great Lambrusco for $10, $10 a bottle. There's a, um, a Cava for $16. There's a Champagne for $18 a brute. I, just to give you an example, so this doesn't have to be an expensive endeavor, right? So again, just do your research, taste, taste, taste choose wisely right the pro proper sparkling for the proper cocktail and um you know be a rock star who knows about spirits and wine right keep learning about wine well <laughs> thank you so much uh, frankie and, and dale i mean this for me is is just great to hang out with you on zoom but you know what would be so much better is let's have some of these cocktails in person Let, yeah. let's get that done Really, really please. Pour you a glass of this stuff. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So, well, thank you all very much again. Um, we'll make sure that recipes are available to you and that that document's available to you so you can see some of those names that we talked about if they flew by the screen too quickly. And, and aside from that, um, let's all get together for tales soon. Soon. Yes. Okay. Keep your spirits up. Stay bubbly. Yeah, yeah perfect. That's it, exactly. <laughs> Thank you all very much. Hey, those, I wore my bubble hey, shirt too. These are bubbles. Oh are yeah, actually, you got bubbles on. Exactly. Yeah, purple bubbles. Come on. Yeah, exactly. Right. <laughs> okay. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Bye.